Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. There's the, there's the benefit globally, um, in the enhancement globally in terms of growth. A lot of people say that you know, technology is, you know, we're not quite sure where we're going to find the next technological revolution. We never know where that is, but they say a lot of that is, is <clears throat> really near the end of its life cycle of what the venture capitalists have looked at before. But we definitely believe that the next real boom in, in, in global growth for the economy is the final unleashing of the, uh, of the emerging market consumer, especially the Asian consumer, um, as this process takes place. It'll be just a natural growth process for the world. And ultimately, um, if China, China will uh, make a change in its currency policy, because it will benefit them, and I'll show you that, um, this whole process could also lead to more balanced global trade. Um, and that's um, and that's the rub here. Um, we're pretty optimistic once we get through this period, you know, over the next I don't know four, five, six, who knows years in the U.S. as we as we continue as we if we if we get our act together. I mean, if you look at some of the numbers on the fiscal side, uh, they're worse than disastrous. Um, but that can that can change. Um, I think if if we can get through this period um, in the next several years, you, you know we we could see more stabilized and lower volatility growth uh, going forward. But I won't get into all of that. But this is a natural process of squeezing out from a real global macro standpoint value uh, for the emerging market economies, and China is quickly moving down that path. This point here just shows um, this is showing just the the savings, the relative savings of um, as a you know, relative to gross domestic uh, product. And you can see China has just, you know, year after year from 2001 on, this is, has only been updated through 2006, and it's from Standard & Poor's, this chart, um, up over 50% in terms of the savings rate. Now, that's all, and that goes to that forced savings that I talked about in China, and you tend to see that, too, in other markets, but China really does it from a policy perspective. And another thing is, you know, China because they've driven so much into their export and so much in infrastructure, um, that is their economy. And they really haven't provided the safeguards to provide, you know, for the consumer, um, the consumer being a person in China that has to save a lot in order to, you know, for a rainy day. He doesn't have the Social Security, the insurance, all those types of things. If he gets sick, he has to go, <clears throat> excuse me, to the hospital and pay cash. So it, it, that, so not only do you have artificially low interest rates in China, um, not only do you have the capital controls that don't allow the Chinese citizens to move their money offshore, um, you don't have the safeguards in China for the citizens, uh, the fallback mechanisms that are necessary to build a, a vibrant or stable consumer economy. So what happens, you, hit, you get these massive uh, amount of savings. And if, <clears throat> so if you look at them in another way, it's really just stored up wealth or stored up capital that potentially will be unleashed. And when we say that we think that's going to be in the next driver, uh, you know, and again, not that we're the first to see this. People saw this many, many years ago. But we're on the cusp of this starting, you know, potentially starting to change as China starts to see um, the advantages of building the domestic economy. And ultimately, um, uh, the path toward a vibrant domestic economy for the Chinese citizen is a path for them of creating more freedoms for them. And especially in a, in, in a, in a time when we have such global dis dislocation and uncertainty um, is why the Chinese in here, uh, the Chinese policymakers are, are still very, very nervous and have still been hesitant to make a move on building a domestic economy, even though they know it's, uh, it's going to be ultimately very beneficial for them. I mean, think of it this way. They're dependent so much on the U.S. for, for driving, you know, uh, their export growth, why would they ever want to be that dependent on somebody else when they ultimately don't have to be? And the reason is, socially, they're just afraid to make that change at the moment. Um, just looking at this chart and just comparing, if you just compare some of the major things, and, uh, and this goes, again, 
especially with China, but also across the emerging world compared to the developed world, you know, big budget surpluses versus budget deficits, trade surpluses versus trade deficits. The deck is really stacked from a wealth standpoint um, or, you know, to the emerging markets, and that's why you're seeing that wealth just, you know, continuing to transfer into the emerging uh, and developing world um, because, you know, think of them, if you would look at those, look at the developed world and the emerging world as two different companies and you look at their balance sheets, you know, one would look very, very good and the other would look awful. Um, and not only the one looks very, very good, not only does the balance sheet look good, um, but the growth opportunities look good for, for all those things we just talked about, the, the driver of, of GDP and growth in, as, co as economies develop comes from the consumer and they haven't even unleashed that yet. So, so, the, so there's no surprise why the money continues to move offshore out of the developed world in general, not just the U.S., um, for these opportunities. And given that the, that the developed world has burdened themselves with so much debt during this because of the credit crunch, the growth opportunities, you're going to have lower capacity or sub-capacity growth potential really in all the developed world. Um, going forward, which is another reason you're going to see people in the developed world that have the money moving it offshore, stretching again for yield, stretching again for, <clears throat> excuse me, return, and why we think uh, these currencies, these emerging developed world currencies, if you just look at them purely on a global macro basis and think of nothing else, you want to have access to this area in your portfolio. There's so no doubt you're going to see volatility, but I, th I think you know long term. You know, if we if if we wake up in ten years and we look at the the valuation of some of these, especially the Asian block currencies, um, where they are now, where they will be in you know in in a, in a decade, will be I think I think we'll be shocked. Um, obviously, we could be very wrong, but we think it you know they're extremely undervalued, and I'll get to the reasons why in just a second. Presently, um, China has what's called a um, crawling peg. Their currency regime is, a, is what's called a crawling peg system. Um, uh, in July of 2005, they, they made this one-off uh, appreciation um, against the U.S. dollar, and it went up 2.1%. And that's when I said back, in, back then, uh, all the economists were very excited, and all these bankers that had these multi-currency accounts did all this advertising, come invest in the Chinese currency, um, and you're going to, pretty much make money all the time because they're, from now on they're going to continue to increase the value of the currency. Well, they haven't really done anything uh, since then of, of significance. So um, that's, so, you know, because of the reasons that I said. Um, they allow supposedly the, the currency in this peg system to fluctuate each day, and these, these are the general rules. But ultimately China makes the rules and determines what happens in that basket. The rumor now um, in the markets by, by different people around the world is that China will revalue its currency anywhere from 5 to 10 percent. Two reasons um, we think that could happen. Um, number one, we have the, you know, it's kind of a bone that they're going to throw to the West because, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, lot of pressure growing, and I'll explain why. Um, and number two, um, you're seeing, you know, they probably want to get out in front of this, um, I think next month the U.S. Term, has, has their big you know, global report on who's manipulating trade type of thing, and China wants to get out in front of this and um, you know, probably skin, and squash that. And, and also I think China is realizing that they need to really start focusing more on um, this idea of the consumer. And big speech by, forget, forget his name, um, last week, in fact, said we need to start for focusing more on the consumer. So they are understanding that they need to make this transition and, and realizing that the money that they spent um, in here in stimulus um, really went too much into driving um, infrastructure growth at the expense of creating internal demand. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.